All right, guys, I got to let you know that I'm pretty excited about doing this video. As you guys see from the title, we're going to be talking about Chris Broussard. And for some of those who, uh, for those of you who do not know who Chris Broussard is, he is a commentator. And I think he's on Fox Sports South or Fox Sports and, and or, or ESPN is one of them. No, I think it's I think it's Fox Sports. Anyway, came across this video, and it was kind of surprising for me to see him on Sonnetter TV. Now, for those of you who do not know who Sonnetter is, Sonnetter is one of these black conscious guys, and he has a YouTube channel called Sonnetter TV. He actually has two two channels, but the one that I know uh, of is Sonnetter TV, and he had Chris Broussard on. So I was like, well, what is Chris Broussard doing on saw netter tv and the first thing that popped into my mind was maybe chris broussard is one of these conscious hotep guys so i decided to give the video a listen and to my surprise chris broussard is a very sharp christian dude very sharp so i'm not even going to waste any more time talking about this let's just go ahead get right into the video and like I usually do, start it, stop it, give my own two cent, and we're just going to take it from there. Peace and Black Power family, welcome to another Sonnetta TV House of Consciousness production. As you can see, we got Chris Bruzal in the building. We're sitting down here having some lunch at Sylvia's on 127th Street, Malcolm X Boulevard. And uh, me and the brother are going to deal with a few topics. First of all, I want to ask you, my brother, what is, what is the topic you prefer to talk about in September? So we're going to have to get that date together and uh, let the people know what you want to build on, on on that particular day. Well, in September, I would like to speak about uh, a topic that I'll call destroying the myth that Christianity is the white man's religion. Stop right there. Um, I just love the way he just went right into it. And, you know, and that's the way we have to be, guys, when people, when they want to sit down and talk to us, we can't be man be pan but we can't be beating around the bush. We got to dive right into it. So, first point, I love the way he just dove right into this this conversation. Um, I have a lot of respect for the brothers and sisters in the conscious community, the black conscious community. Um, but one of the downfalls of the conscious community is that it is very anti-Christian. Um, and it, it really doesn't have the respect for the black Christians or the black church. Uh, that I believe it should have. It's undebatable um, if you look at what the black church has done for America um, or for blacks in America, um, that it's been, it's been very helpful to us as a people. Has it done everything it could or should do? No. But I would argue it's done far more than any other organization out there. Um, so it deserves some respect. But it does have its shortfalls. It doesn't teach all the true biblical history uh, that it should. Blacks in the Bible and things like that. Christianity in Africa long before the slave trade. Centuries before the religion of Islam even existed. Um, one, some scholars even say that Christianity has been in Africa so long uh, that it can rightly be called a traditional African religion so all right so let's stop it right there and I want to go ahead and put this disclaimer out there for you guys now I don't know what Chris Broussard's theology is I don't know if he's one of those people who are of the black liberation theology I'm not sure I'm just found, finding out about this today so I really haven't done my research to see where he's coming from when it comes to this type of stuff black liberation theology which is something that we're battling right now within the body of christ i just haven't gotten around to making videos addressing that uh for people who actually want to know what is black liberation theology i'll save that topic for another time but i just want to say that i don't uh, totally agree with everything that chris says but the things that he is saying uh depending on if he if he follows black liberation theology in the church and all of that stuff will it play a role in me questioning what does he believe about uh christ and and the deity of christ which he's going to get into in this video but from what i've heard i don't think that he's too much into black liberation theology and 
there's a couple of things that he said that I kind of don't disagree with, but those are so small and so minute that I wouldn't even write this brother off, you know, as not being a Christian or being someone who's just wearing a Christian title, as we're going to see in this video. So let's let's go ahead and continue. What I want to talk about is destroying the myth that Christianity is the white man's religion because a lot of well-meaning, strong, and thorough brothers and sisters are missing out uh, on the joy, the peace, and the blessings that come from faith in Jesus Christ because of this myth that it is the white man's religion. So that's what I want to talk about in September. Oh, you was talking about um, the Christian church and how a lot of our people need to respect that because we come from the Christian church and the church was there when we was getting up out of slavery. We had that church to go to. But what if I was to tell you that the only book that they allow us to read was the Bible? Maybe that's why our people is somewhat skeptical of the Bible, don't want to trust the Bible because that was the only book that they allow us to read. And then when we started doing research and studying about ancient Kemet and looking on the walls where we could see Asar, Heru, and Aset, and that's the Trinity right there. So what is your take on that when, when I tell you that if you go back far enough, you, are, you will already see the story already on the walls. And some of the stuff that's in the Bible has just been plagiarized from ancient Kemet, which is your ancestors. Your ancestors done that. So what did you think about that? All right, stop right there because <laughs> you can look at Chris's face and he's like, I don't, I've heard this before and he's getting ready to dive right into this. And this is what I loved about this video. Uh, but if any of you guys have ever run into the conscious community or dialogued or even had some type of talking or listened to any of their videos, you know that you're going to get this a lot, that Jesus is just a carbon copy of Horus and Isis and the Trinity was something that was just constructed uh, by ancient Egypt and then the white man of Europe came and just plagiarized it. So let's go ahead and let's listen to what Chris has to say and how he responds to this. And I want you guys to pay attention to this because you may want to whip out a notebook. Uh, I think I may need to whip out a notebook on this, but let's just hear how he responds to this. Well, first of all, to your, your first point about the Christian church, um, first of all, when, the, when we were initially placed in slavery, the slave masters and, and white society in general would not teach us Christianity because they knew it was an egalitarian religion. And so they felt like if we really lay, took a hold of Christianity in its true essence, we're going to want freedom because Christianity teaches that you're equal, that, you know, all people, regardless of race, are created in the image of God. Uh, it teaches that God is not a respecter of persons, that he shows personal favoritism to no man. And so they believe that we would have felt like uh, we're equal and we should not be enslaved and we should be free. So they held off on teaching us, if you will, Christianity. It was only when they made an agreement with the preachers. The preacher said, you know what, we'll just teach about heaven, about the afterlife. We won't teach true Christianity. We won't teach about the benefits it has here. And when they did that, that's when the slave masters allowed the traveling evangelists to preach to the slaves. Okay, so they understood that true Christianity, if Africans laid a whole of it here in America, that it would spark a desire to be free. And if you look at history, that's exactly what it did. So as you can see from his response, just to go ahead and wrap it up in a nutshell, for those who may just be, be able to start following what he's saying. And I've always had this argument myself that if black people were not allowed to read, period, why would they be given a Bible just to learn how to read that? Because if you teach them to read the Bible, then you have to teach them how to read, period. So it was it, that's already a, a, a self-refuting statement. There was no slave masters giving black people the Bible and then teaching them to read that Bible and to read that only. 
I mean, that's that that's just like giving a person a gun and saying that, okay, I know that you want to shoot me with it, but what I'm going to do is that I'm I'm going to only allow you to have this gun, knowing that you want to harm me with it, but I'm going to give you the gun, but you can only shoot at that target. It doesn't make sense. It's self-refuting. So in order for slaves to know how to read the Bible, they would have, they would have been taught to learn how to read, period. So, and I just love the way that he just kind of went into that and he just broke that down, mm -hmm. you know, without pausing or, or anything like that. I mean, he just right into it. Nat Turner, who I know is one of the patron saints in the conscious community, a Christian. David Walker, who was speaking more fire than Malcolm X, a Christian. Frederick Douglass, who was one of the greatest men, certainly Americans ever to walk this earth a Christian, Sojourner Truth, uh, Harriet Tubman, true freedom fighters, Christians, Bishop Henry McNeil Turner, a Christian, Richard Allen, who formed a free African society. So the founders of the first newspapers in black America, the first insurance companies in black America, the first mutual aid societies in black America were all Bible-based, Bible-believing, Christians, and I'm not talking about just churchgoers, but I'm talking about people who had a true personal relationship and encounter with Jesus Christ. And we could go on and on down the line, and I, I'm going to hit y'all with this because I know that some people think it's impossible possible to be conscious and to be a Christian. Marcus Garvey, who is the hero of the black conscious movement, was a Christian. And again, not just a nominal Christian, not just somebody that was Christian because we, we were made to be Christians. This was a man, if you read his books, if you study the United Negro Improvement Association, he was a firm, sincere believer in Jesus Christ. So, as you can see, this man is dropping so much knowledge on Sonetter and these conscious guys. I, I mean, I'm not the sharpest nail in the box. I mean, I can hold my own with having certain conversations. But as you can see, Chris is like super sharp on this subject. And this is a lot of stuff that black Christians don't really understand or they don't really know. Like, I knew that Marcus Garvey was a Christian and he actually denounced a lot of uh, people who would basically bash the Christian faith. Like he didn't, he didn't get along with the Nation of Islam and and all of these guys and all these conscious conscious guys. But the conscious guys will hold to him and look at him as the father or as the pioneer of this movement. But they want to throw out the fact that he was a Christian, that he had Christian beliefs. Same thing when it comes to like guys like Frederick Douglass and Nat Turner and Sojourner Truth and and Harriet Tubman and all of these people who did things in the name of Christ. They didn't do this in the name of consciousness. His foundational scripture for the UNIA was Psalm 68, 31. Princes shall come out of Egypt. Ethiopia shall soon stretch forth her hands unto God. I founded a men's movement called the King Movement. And I didn't make that one of our foundational scriptures because of Marcus Garvey, but that is one of our foundational scriptures, Psalm 68, 31, because that's a prophecy that when men of, when men of color... Egypt, Ethiopia, stretch forth our hands to God, submit to the true God that we will become royalty, princes. So now this is another point where I don't know what he's talking about exactly. And I'm not going to say that I totally agree with what he just said. I mean, I, I have to look that scripture up for myself and see exactly what it says in this context before I can actually co-sign on what Chris says. But like I stated earlier, this is something that is small. It's a small issue, and it's not something that he, you know, he's not spitting some heresy or something like that. So I would definitely not say that this guy is a Christian. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that this guy isn't a Christian. But like I said, this is just a small secondary issue. But as you can see, the man knows his stuff. I mean, he's just going, he, I mean, this is just the tip of the iceberg. We haven't really even gotten to the rest of the video. So let me go ahead and stop my babble and just let him continue to speak. Marcus Garvey was in line with that. Marcus Garvey even talked about, look, the hypocrisy of so-called white Christians, the, the way that they've misused the faith and twisted the Bible. He said, that will never turn me against Jesus Christ. Okay, so anyone who... Very important to understand, guys. 
Um, you know, and that's what Marcus Garvey said. And and it's just so funny how these guys from the conscious community will sit back and say, oh, well, once I found out that Jesus was made up by the white man, then that just led me to leave the faith. When Marcus Garvey himself said that none of that is going to make me leave the faith. I'll never turn my back on Jesus. But these conscious guys use that as an excuse. Who claims to be a nationalist, who claims to love Marcus Garvey, who claims to be a Garveyite, but then wants to diss Christianity? You way out of pocket because the thing Marcus Garvey would tell you, the thing that made him strong, the thing that empowered him to fight for our liberation and freedom was his faith in Jesus Christ. And that's well documented. So those are some of the things I mean when I say we need to respect the church and the work is done. I'm not de denying that there's been abuses and misuses and some things have been twisted and, and not taught. But we have certainly done a, a great amount, uh, speaking to the black church, to help liberate our people, even though we need to do more. Um, now, you said they let us read the Bible. They didn't let us read anything. No, I mean, it, it, <clears throat> if you was reading the Bible or Freedom's Journal or the newspaper or whatever, or, or a white children's book, you got lynched or killed or di disciplined, whipped. So it ain't like they was like, oh, here, read this. They wouldn't teach us to read the Bible. They didn't want us reading the Bible. So so just like I said earlier, guys, same thing that Chris is saying, that they didn't teach black people to read the Bible because teaching black people to read the Bible was teaching them to read, period. So just like I said before, it's a self-refuting argument. They didn't allow us to read anything. It was just that at that time in American history, the Bible was by far the most you know, prevalent book in the country, whites and blacks. I mean, if you look at the first schools in America, obviously they were founded for white people. The book that they taught white kids how to read from was the Bible. So it wasn't that they allowed us to read that book. That was really the one book everybody in America was trying to get its hands on or even had access to. So um, now as far as the Trinity in uh, Egypt, well, this is what we have to realize. The Bible is not just a book written to Jews and Christians. The Bible is a book written to and about all of mankind, okay? And the blacks, I mean, <laughs> the black presence in the Bible is just throughout the book. I mean, it is all throughout the book. Um, Ethiopia or African nations, whether it's Ethiopia, Cush, Mizraim, which is Egypt, uh, the land of Ham, you know, whatever the name may be, Cyrene. African nations are mentioned more than a thousand times in the Bible. If you look in the Old Testament, European nations, namely Greece and Rome, mention less than 50 times in the Bible, in the Old Testament. So the Bible is very much a book about African people and people in general. We know anthropology, archaeology, science, biology, and the Bible all teach that the first human beings were African. Genesis, it, it tells you where the Garden of Eden was, where God placed Adam and Eve. It mentions the land of Ethiopia. Now, you know, just like I said earlier, guys, um, you know, this is stuff that I have to study myself. But I do know that some scholars do say that the Garden of Eden may have been around the Horn of Africa. Just based on the text and just a clear and, and just a really deep study of the text, they say that, um, you know, things that are mentioned in the Bible, like the Tigris River, um, and I think in the Pishon River and all of these other places, which are found over there in that region of the world. And, you know, we can technically say that maybe this faith did start in Africa, on the Horn of Africa. But to be honest, that's, that's, that's neither here nor there. And like I said before, this is these are secondary issues it's nothing that i would you know rebuke him for saying or anything like that and and there's nothing really to debate over but like i said before you know i got to keep reiterating this point because like i said i don't know if chris Bassard is you know what the black liberation of theology um i just think that it's refreshing to hear a black man defend the faith against these black conscious people. And I mean, we can get into the theology of Chris later, 
you know, if I do some some quick research on them. But other than that, that's that, that's secondary issues. It mentions the Gihon River, the Pishon River. Those are the blue and white Nile rivers. So it clearly tells you they replaced Adam and Eve, the first human beings in Africa. So it's logical to understand that human beings understood that God was triune. Okay, that's why in Christianity we say the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the quote-unquote Trinity, even though the word Trinity is never mentioned in the Bible. So I'm not hung up on the word Trinity. But Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three persons in one God. Okay? When, when, when God created man, he said, let us make man. So Adam and Eve understood that there was three persons in the one God, us. Okay? So, of course, what they do? What, you do, what do you do to your children? You teach them. You pass things down. So they pass down that knowledge that God is triune. And that's why in Egypt and even other parts of the globe, now they all got it from Egypt. But, you know, we know Egypt wasn't even the first civilization. Ethiopia had civilizations before Egypt. Egypt was a colony of, of Ethiopia. But they understood the triune nature of the one true God. So that's why you see trinities in various, you know, old ancient societies even before Jesus Christ came cuz they Now, I want to go ahead and stop it right there real quick, guys. And this is one of the things that you will hear from the black conscious community is that they believe that the trinity was man, woman and child. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Just like Chris said, it teaches God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That is the, the Holy Trinity that we're, that we're talking about. You know, we're not talking about man, woman, and child. So this is where reading the Bible actually becomes very important. You know, not only just to us, but to the conscious community as well. Of getting that fundamental understanding of what we mean by a Trinity or a triune God. Understood that God was triune. Now... Let's look at specifics, because a similarity doesn't make something, you know, equal or legitimate. Exactly. And this is what I try to talk to these, these uh, conscious guys about. Just because you may see a similarity here and there between the Bible and something else, that doesn't mean that the Bible stole from that. You know, and I can go ahead and get into all types of reasons of that you have people who had certain hierarchies in certain civilizations who were only allowed to be access to certain knowledge and to, and, and to certain texts and, and, and things like that. Whereas people who were just peasants, like the disciples, they wouldn't have had access to any of this information. So it would have been impossible for these guys to take information that the people who were high up in society, the information that they had. So it would have been, you know, pretty difficult for just the average normal person to get their hands on these type of texts. I can give you a counterfeit dollar bill and it's just going to be different in, in a minor way. So the fact that it's similar in all these other ways doesn't mean you accept that dollar bill. If it's counterfeit in one area, you reject it. So if you look at the story of the Trinity in Egypt, Osiris, Isis, and Horus, and you gave the Egyptian names for them, now, first of all, it's a little bit confusing because at times Horus is called the father of Isis and at other times he's viewed as the son of Isis. But regardless, the story is that Osiris, or Set, who was Osiris' brother, was upset because Osiris was named the king. Okay? So Set killed Osiris and then chopped him up into 14 pieces and sent his body parts all throughout the land. Isis, Osiris' wife, went to collect the 14 pieces and she collects the 14 body parts of Osiris and then when she finally gets all the parts, there's an immaculate conception and Horus is born, okay? Now, that is indeed a trinity, Osiris, Isis, and Horus, but that's completely different than the story of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
the father, who I guess would be Osiris in that respect, he was never chopped up into 14 pieces. He ain't ever had a brother that, you know, was jealous of him and, and killed him. You know, uh, a Horus in the Egyptian trinity, his whole purpose for being resurrected was what? To go kill Set, who had killed his father. Okay, that's not the purpose of Jesus Christ. It wasn't to avenge God. God don't need to be avenged. God is God. He don't need to be avenged. Jesus came to redeem mankind, to save human beings from their sins. So his purpose was entirely different than horses. You see what I'm saying? And so the only similarity is that it's three. <laughs> and again, I, I explain how people knew there was the triune nature of God. So... That's where, you know, Jesus himself even said in John chapter 10, many have come before me, but they were false. So there were many people who claimed to be the Messiah. They understood the prophecy of Genesis chapter 3. Our African ancestors understood when God said, look, after Adam and Eve fell, he said to the devil, you're going to bruise his heel. But the seed of woman going to come and you're going to bruise his heel, but he going to bruise your head. The ancients knew that was a prophecy that God was going to send a Messiah to redeem mankind from what the devil had done, which has made us slaves to sin. And so there were a lot of people that claimed to be Messiah or people that people lifted up to be the Messiah before Christ came. But he came. And he fulfilled over 600 prophecies in the Old Testament, written by a handful of different authors, written in different countries, in a few different languages. Yet they add up to the, all the things he did in the New Testament. So that's how we know he's the true Messiah. And so you know, this is a man that the Bible describes as having feet the color of burnt brass and hair like lambs. Well, there's only one group of people on earth <laughs> with hair like lambs wool, right? And that's black people. So now I just want to go ahead and stop it right there. Um, like I said, he's been given some great information, some great defenses when, whenever you're engaging these black conscious guys. Now the whole hair like wool, feet like bronze thing. I don't think that that describes Jesus's color. Um, I think that, that those are metaphors for something else. And to be honest, uh, guys, I really haven't studied that passage, you know, in its entirety to see exactly what the, the, the white hair like wool and the, you know, feet like bronze. You know, I haven't studied that to see what the symbolism is or, or what does it mean. So I'm just going to say that, I, you know, I'm really not too sure, but but I really don't think that. It was talking about the, the skin color of Christ. So I just wanted to kind of put that out there. Um, this is the story, the true Christianity. I'm not bringing no watered down white supremacist version of Christianity. I'm about true biblical Christianity. That's a book written primarily by people of color, a lot of African people. And it's a book that, you know, I believe if we get, if we lay hold of it wholeheartedly, it'll change our lives, our indiv individually, our communities, our families, and, and it's done that for me, and uh, I think it can do that for all of us. Being a sports commentator, <laughs> no, 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 known all over the world. Do you feel comfortable teaching this teaching? Because sometimes you might offend certain people, your colleagues, they are European. They might hear you talking about Jesus and all the prophets in the Bible were black or were of African descent. Do you feel comfortable teaching that? And have you ever got into any discussions with some of your colleagues behind closed doors? You ain't got to name names or nothing. Just talk about that. Now, this is one of the things, and... One thing that I do that, that I can say is that I, I do respect Sonnetter for actually having a nice dialogue with this guy. Um, you know, he's not jumping in and out. He's not stopping him. He's letting Chris speak. And he's just asking some pretty valid questions. And I want you guys to really just pay attention to, to what Chris is going to say on this topic. And 
just pay attention and think about that the next time you do engage someone you know of the conscious community or anyone who uh asks you these, this the same question well you know i'm a man of god and that means i'm free so i'm free you know, and I, I, I answer to God. You know, I don't purposely go out to offend people. Um, and I don't think this teaching is offensive. You know, it's just truth. And I don't deny the role that, that white people have played in Christianity either. Because they have, you know, spread. They've brought the Bible all over the world, you know, um, in the last 2,000 years. Like I said, if you look in the Old Testament, Europeans didn't play much of a role in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, who wasn't European, he was actually uh, a Hebrew. We know that. He was mistaken for an Egyptian, for an African, uh, because of the way he looked. He took the gospel to the Europeans. Okay? You look at a lot of the books in the New Testament. They're written to Corinth, Thessalonica. Galatia, Ephesus, these are European countries or, or European towns or places in Asia Minor. So one of the missions of Paul was to bring the gospel to the Europeans to teach them about the true God. In fact, if you look in Acts chapter 11, then you will see that the first people to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Greeks or Europeans were African men from Cyrene. Because it was a time when the Jews really weren't sure they wanted to bring the gospel to the Europeans. Because Peter, you know, was very pro-Hebrew. And he was, you know, they didn't have good relationships with the, the he, uh, Europeans because Rome was oppressing them. And they weren't, they didn't really want to bring the gospel to them. And if you look at Acts chapter 11, it says the men of Cyrene, Cyprus and Cyrene, those were places in Africa they went to the Europeans in Greece and preached Jesus. So we went to Europe as missionaries before they went to Africa as missionaries. So to answer your question, you know, I, I, don't, I don't worry about, you know, uh, offending anyone because I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is just truth. And um, to be honest, a lot of people... Uh, in the sports industry are into religion <laughs> anyway, so they might not care one way or the, they aren't, you know, they might not care one way or the other, you know. But, um, nah, like I said, I don't deny the, the history, you know, um, that, that whites have played, whether it's in religion or Christianity or even any other. I mean, look, white people have translated the Bible into almost every language known to man. That's a great work. You know, I mean, they've certainly done a lot of evil things, and they wouldn't deny that. Um, but they have done productive things as well. And so as long as you speak... And I think that that is so important to point out, guys, that just because you have some white people back in the day who took the Bible and they did evil things with it doesn't mean that everyone who was white had a sinister motive behind the Bible. You know, just like he just said, that there's a lot of people who took the Bible and they did good things and they brought the gospel to uh, certain people who didn't have access to it. So that that's another great point. And I think that that's something that you guys may want to put down in your notes to remember whenever you're engaging in a dialogue or a conversation like this with a conscious person. Truth, whether it's, you know, white truth, black truth, Hispanic truth, whatever, um... I don't think it should be offensive to anybody, but it will. The, the gospel is offensive. Some people get offended by the gospel. The history. Talk to me a little bit about the history of the Hebrew Israelites in the Bible. Who were the Hebrew Israelites? Well, the Hebrew Israelites were um, <clears throat> descendants of Abraham and Isaac, Isaac and Jacob. Yeah, Isaac and, Jake, yeah. and if you look at where they came out of, they came out of Egypt, which obviously is Africa, and they came out as a mixed multitude. They had mixed with the Egyptians. Um, they were people, descendants of Shem, and people of color anyway, but they also mixed, just like African Americans, when we were enslaved here in America, we mixed with white people, they mixed with Egyptians. So when they came out, they were a mixed multitude with African blood without question. 
In fact, you look at the genealogy of Jesus, he had uh, three women listed in his genealogy. One of them is um, Rahab, who was a Canaanite. She was a descendant of Ham. Ham was black, you know, and, and he's known as the father of the African, -Amer African race, although, like we said, Adam and Eve were African according to the Bible. Um, but she, um, so Rahab was a Canaanite, black. Tamar, you know, was uh, a black woman. And um, Bathsheba, who was the wife of Uriah the Hittite, the Hittites were descendants of Ham, who was African. So if she was the same race as her husband, she's black. So at least three out of the four women named in Jesus' genealogy in the Gospels were black women. By African-American standards or American standards, that makes you black. You know, I mean, obviously, I'm a person with mixed blood in me. I mean, all, all the relatives I know are black, but obviously I have some white blood in me, but I'm black. Right. You know, in America, you, you got some black blood in you, you black. So Jesus had black blood in him, according to the Gospels. And he also had, you know, Cain, Rahab was a, was a whore, okay? He had blood in him, um of people downtrodden, you know? So he didn't come to just the royal people, the kings. He came to lift the downtrodden and had blood from people who were downtrodden in his veins, you know? Well, um, you know, just on that point, guys, um, and like I said, I don't know if Chris Bassard is someone who believes in, you know, black liberation theology, but these are some of the same talking points that a lot of people from that type of mindset have. And for people who may be new to the faith or who may still be studying, when it comes to Christ and his finished work on the cross, you know, he didn't come to be downtrodden because, or to try to relate to people who are downtrodden or who are oppressed. You know, he came to die for the sins of man. Um, and that was a choice. It wasn't something that, that, you know, someone else just did to him. It's, it's not like they oppressed Jesus. But what he did was that he chose to take on the sins of man and die on the cross not just for a certain group of people so i just want to kind of clear that up just in case there are some people out there who are confused just to kind of throw that out there so he he came to reach all people i would love for you to have a conversation with one of my brothers his name is michael edwards and he loves and respects you when i told him i was beating you today he's in california right now he was like, oh, Sarnetta, man, go ahead, brother, go ahead. Because he's a Hebrew Israelite. But he's not, see, remember I told you earlier that there's so many Hebrew Israelites that don't teach the same thing. There are Hebrew Israelites that teach that Africans are our enemy and that we are not the same people. This brother who I'm talking about, Michael Lepper, said, nah, you wrong, brother. We are all the same people. I know you and him would have a great build. Maybe we can do it on over the phone one day whenever you got time. Give us a little half an hour and have a nice little bill with the brother. Now, um, but what do you say to those Hebrew Israelites that's not all of them? To the ones that say the Africans are not our people, I wouldn't even feed them. I wouldn't even feed them because I got Hebrews that say that. I wouldn't even give them nothing to eat. They not our people. We got to keep them out of here. Well, I would say this, that the Jews or the Hebrews, Judaism was never an ethnicity. It's, it's not a race. It is a religion. And the proof is in the fact that, number one, they proselytized. They went out and made converts. Now, how do you convert somebody to a race? You can, I, black people don't go out and try to convert people to being black. White people don't try to convert people to become part of the white race. Your race is set, or your ethnicity, right? But you can convert people to a religion. Christians go out and convert people, evangelize, convert people to Christianity. Muslims go out and try to convert people to Islam. Jews go out and try to convert people to Judaism. That is one evidence that Judaism was never about ethnicity. It was about the faith the faith in the one true God, okay? The second thing is if you look in the book of Acts chapter two, 
on the day of Pentecost, when Peter preached the gospel to the Jews on the day of Pentecost, it says there were Jews from every nation. And it names, you know, 10 to 12 nations of people that were there of different ethnicities. Okay, many of them African. Okay, so there were Jews from different, you know, nations, ethnicities, even at that time. Okay, so that's the evidence that Judaism is a religion. It's, a, it's not a race. Okay, so you can be a member of the black race and be a Hebrew. But so spiritually, the Africans may not be your brother, but ethnically, they're definitely your brother. Now, let me say this about the black Jews. There are the, 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 well, the Hebrew Israelites, but I'm talking now internationally now. There are Hebrewisms that they call Hebrewisms in West Africa, where they have found whether it's language similarities, the different African religions or, or languages have similarities to Hebrew. They found forms of rituals, you know, many different things that suggest that there were Jews in West Africa. And that's where the Hebrew Israelites get the notion and the idea that that's one place they, that we as African Americans were the biblical Jews because they know there were Judaisms and Jewish people in West Africa. Since we were captured from there in slavery, they believe, that's why they believe we're the Jews. Now, let me say this too, the Limba tribe. There's a Limba tribe in Southern Africa, African people, jet black, okay? Their, their tradition is that they traveled down from the mid, what's called the Middle East, but really was a part of Africa, but down the, the east coast of Africa all the way to South Africa. When Europeans encountered them a few decades ago, they found the Limba tribe, pure Africans, practicing Judaism, okay? With all the rituals, the book, the Bible, the Torah, everything, okay? And the, the Limba told them, look, we've been Jews for thousands of years. Our ancestors came down the coast of East Africa. Of course, the Europeans didn't believe them. Then they did a DNA test and they found there's a group of Jews in Europe called the Kohenite Jews who are believed to be the true descendants of the true biblical Jews. Because most Jews in the world today are, know they're not physical descendants of the true Jews. They found that those jet black Africans in South Africa called the Limba tribe had the same DNA as the Kohenite white Jews up in Europe. So they were brothers. And they, uh, they had to admit that these Limba tribe Jews were official, legitimate Jewish people. Okay, they just had an oral history that they, just like the Bible, the Bible initially was recorded as oral history because that's what Africans have done. And so they had a good oral history. Now you say, oh, you saying there's white Jews up in Europe that was true biblical descendants? In 70 AD, Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans, okay? So, when it was destroyed by the Romans, the Bible says that the Jews were dispersed and they went all over the place. Some went into Asia, some went into Europe, some went into Africa. Flavius Josephus, one of the most renowned scholars in history, he said a million Jews went into Central Africa. So we know there was black Jews in Africa at that time. So obviously, as you, if you went to Europe or Asia or Africa, over time, you were gonna intermingle and take on the physical characteristics of those people. And that's why you, that's one reason you have Jews of different races today. The other reason, of course, as I said, is that you have many people that convert to Judaism, which is a religion, not a race. Well, I'm definitely impressed by the knowledge and information you have, brother. I, I love it, man. Powerful right there. So um, let me move this on because I know we ain't going to be here all day. So let, let's move it on to another. All right, guys. So that's the end of that video. Um, this is kind of like a two-part video. And I think the second one, he was just talking about some NBA stuff. And I, I to be honest, I didn't, I didn't watch the other part of the video, but I did watch this one. And I thought that this was a great discussion that these two guys had. And like I said before... Like, I want to give a shout-out to Sonetta right now for actually having such a cordial 
calm discussion, you know, talking about this issue because you get a lot of people from the conscious community, especially these newer guys. And like I said, when I was a part of the conscious community before, um, you know, when we would have discussions with people who were Christian, you didn't have all of the hollering and the insults and all of that stuff. I mean, you know, you just, what you just saw, what you just witnessed is someone who is a person from the conscious community who's been in it for a while. And that's how you can tell who is really of the conscious community and who really isn't. So kind of going back to that last point when he, when Chris is talking about the Jews and he is right. You're going to have Jews who are of different races because when Jerusalem was invaded in, in 70 AD by Nero, a, a lot of Jews were scattered. So, you know, they went into Europe, they went into Africa and all of these other surrounding places. That's how you had, you know, Jews who ended up in Poland and Germany and, and places like that. And, you know, I think it was, what is it, 1948 is when they went back or, or 1950 or something like that. When Israel became a state and a lot of Jews have been moving back, you know, ever since. But there's still a lot of conflict over that, you know, genealogies and stuff like that. But, you know, as I digress, but a lot of the black Hebrew Israelites, they claim Judaism, but they haven't done any genealogy tests to see if they are actually from Israel. And But I've done, I've done a uh, genealogy test on me and... My roots only go back to Africa. And that's why whenever I get some of these guys, these black Hebrew Israelites, and they're just like, man, you know, you did you know that you from the descent? You were descended from the tribe of Judah and all of this stuff. And I'm like, I've already done a genealogy test, man. You know, you don't you don't have to come at me with that. I know where my roots are from. But, you know, just like Chris said, you know, this is something that you you are converted into. You can convert to Judaism. Just because you're black or just because you're white or just because your hair is kinky or straight doesn't necessarily mean that you are from the tribe of Judah or you are from that lineage. Um, it's impossible to trace somebody back to the tribe of Judah because Judah has just been scattered. And there's been so much intermingling and, and mixing and all of that. It's, it's impossible to trace somebody back to a certain particular tribe. But like I said, guys, you know, shout out to Sonetta for actually sitting down to having Chris on. And I am shocked. I am really shocked. I would have never thought that I, that Chris Broussard was just basically this deep into the faith as he is. You know, I remember I posted a clip of Ernie Johnson. Ernie Johnson, who was a commentator on, on TNT, and I'm going to leave a link to that video in the description. And Ernie Johnson... He basically just shared the gospel live in front of millions, you know, and this is right after the Donald Trump election. So, and I thought that that was big, but I think that this here is, 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 is a lot bigger. And, um, I'm going to leave a link to the full video without my commentary in the description box below guys. And just let me know what you think about the video. You know, do you really think that Chris Bouchard is a person who is a Christian who sold out for Christ or do you think he's faking it? Do you think that he's into the black liberation theology? Or maybe he just knows what he's talking about when it comes to Africa and the Bible. So whatever your comments are, you know, you guys go ahead and leave it in the description box below. Uh, like, rate, share, comment, subscribe. And uh, you guys have a blessed day.